Hello, Eddie Hurst's podcast version of the War of the Worlds listeners. I'm Barry McStay. I'm Ben van der Ven. And we'd love you to listen to Worst Foot Forward, our podcast all about failure. Each week we are joined by a guest to discuss the world's worst something. From detective to invasion, train to horror movie. We dive into humankind's darkest depths in search of the absolute pits. And as HG Wells fans, you'd be glad to know we've covered Worst Aliens, Worst Robot, and Worst Space Invention. Spoiler alert, it's almost definitely the spacesuit invented for humans to have sex in. On Worst Foot Forward, we've learned that conspiracy theorists think rocks aren't really hard, why one French physicist invaded the Channel Island of Sark, and how exactly to make a wasp gun. While also uncovering the railway station of the dead, the doctor who put goat balls into human scrotums, and the West End musical funded by bird poo. Subscribe to Worst Foot Forward on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Check out our website, worstfootforwardpodcast.com, and join us for some fun-filled zero worship. Hello, welcome to Eddie Hurst's podcast version of The War of the Worlds. It is me, the eponymous Eddie Hurst, not The War of the Worlds. Uh, this is it, we're on to Chapter 9, The Fighting Begins. What could it mean with such a cryptic title? I think the fighting's gonna start, lads. That's exactly what happened. We've got soldiers coming in, <laughs> stuff's getting pretty real. And also, guys, uh, I don't want to get you too excited, but we are very much in the presence of the most amount of human interaction the narrator has had since Chapter chapter 1 or 2. Uh, I think Chapter 2, definitely. Uh, so, of course, I've had to get some of my very personal comedy friends in to help me out with it. So, so uh, this week we have uh, the return of Bexy Archer as the wife. We'll also have a bit more of an interview of her talking about aliens and that. We've also got the guys from Potter Vision uh, in who are going to be performing as some soldiers. And we have the fantastic Tom Little who is going to be playing my neighbour in the role, not in real life. I'd be perfectly happy to have him as a neighbour. He's a both a very polite and amenable man, but uh, such is life at the moment. Maybe that'll change. I don't know if afterwards I'd feel a little creeped out if he'd decided now to become a neighbour, to be honest. I'm starting to regret the whole thing about the neighbour. Anyway, let's get started, and before we do, we got to do the weekly admins. Um, since the last episode, we've had a few more listeners, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. Join the show. Um, I'm aware that you may not listen to this because of it being serialised, so you start chapter one and get to here. By the time you listen to this bit, you might already feel like, well, I'm not really a new listener anymore. But hey, if, if you are, welcome. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please support the podcast by liking, sharing, put a review out. If you're listening on Spotify, that's fantastic, but Spotify does not allow you to do any reviews. How annoying! So, if you could go on somewhere like iTunes, it just takes a couple of minutes uh, log into your itunes or go on a site called pod chaser and that collects reviews for everywhere that'd be really helpful for me and um, or follow me on twitter or instagram or facebook i'm at edy hurst eddie hurst um, and and give us a share give us a give us a share of the old podcast there uh, also before we go you might have heard a little advert at the beginning of this that's something new i'm trying out uh, we're supporting each other by by sharing our listenership so uh worst foot forward give them a listen because it's a lovely little old podcast so here we go Chapter 9. The fighting begins. Friday's child is loving and giving. Saturday's child, suspenseful and thrilling. Saturday lives in my memory as a day of suspense. It was a day of lassitude too, hot and close, with, I'm told, a rapidly fluctuating barometer. Hello, uh, lassitude. It, it means tired, fatigue, a lack of energy. Okay, I'll see you later, bye. I had slept but little, though my wife had succeeded in sleeping, and I rose early. I went into my garden before breakfast and stood listening, but towards the common there was nothing stirring but a lark. I don't know what noise a lark makes, I'm sorry. The milkman came as usual. Oh, uh, another character, uh, but he, he does have the same first name as uh, the other two characters uh, in this scene which is the wife and, and the narrator so now we've got the milkman uh, let's see what he's got to say I heard the rattle of his chariot and I went round to the side gate to ask the latest news he told that during the night the Martians had been surrounded by troops and that guns were expected then a familiar reassuring note I heard a train running towards Woking they ought to be killed said the milkman <laughs> 
If that can possibly be avoided. I saw my neighbour gardening and chatted with him for some time and then strolled in to breakfast. It was a most unexceptional morning. My neighbour... There we have another character called my rather than the, so that's a bit of variety in the naming. ...was of opinion that the troops would be able to capture or to destroy the Martians during the day. Hello, Tom Little. Hi, Eric. Are you aware of War of the Worlds? Have you ever read slash seen slash heard it? I am, yes. I I've, I've, I've know the album. Uh, I've read the book and I've seen the uh, live show. Jeff Wins. Seen him do it live. Oh, man, how was it? It was good. It was great. Yeah. Amazing. Which one did, did you see the one like with Liam Neeson? And no. Um, uh, the one I saw had... Uh, it was Richard Burton's voice and he had like a... Yes. Uh, like a computer-generated face of him. Oh, man, that, you, saw the, big model. you saw the the good one then? Yeah, so that's, the, that's the better one. It was uh, R Russell Watson, I think. What a treat. The Siren of Salford. So this is like, he speaks to more people in this chapter than he has done in the whole book so far, um, which is very exciting. And I wanted to have you on as the neighbour. And, and you have said yes. Yep. Uh, we have entered into a legally binding contract. Yep. And now I've recorded it as well. So good luck trying to shirk this responsibility, mate. And uh, so, yeah, what have you ever been a neighbour? Have, have you ever had a neighbour? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, neighbours living out next door, I just tend to avoid people, you know. Um, I feel most people, most people living in cities don't really know who their neighbours are. No. Sure. But obviously, um, living in uh, shared houses, Oh, yeah, uh, an internal neighbour. Yeah. yeah, if that counts. I yeah. remember at uni there being the, the, the slight resentment um, of, like, strangers living in a different way, but that was kind of it. Like, as a, as a teenager, it seemed really odd and uncomfortable, the idea of having a stranger sharing a kitchen. You know, I don't know if that's an incredibly intimate thing, but um, I think you just have to get used to it if you, if you can't find someone to live with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, who's been the best one? I don't, know, I don't know about the best one, but uh, the most notable, I think, was a, a guy who, um, uh, I think he must have like done a lot of drugs or something, right. and sort of got to the point where he wasn't, <laughs> it was always going to have an effect, oh, in, no. in a nice way. Uh, yeah. So he, um, it was like, uh, like got very paranoid about stuff and was convinced about like um, police climbing in through the windows and stuff. <laughs> that was odd. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, did any did any police climb in through the windows? Not as far as I know, but you okay. know, may, may, maybe maybe they were. Unfound was... So unfounded then. It's not as <laughs> yeah. if it had happened before. That was odd. I remember one one time though. Um, uh, we we had a rat that died in like the skirt and board behind the washing machine. Oh mate, no. Uh, and, and we didn't notice really because it until the smell got that bad. And uh, but uh, it was he, him who mentioned it to me, and as uh, we're doing it, I'm thinking, is this real? Has <laughs> <laughs> he hallucinated this thing? It just seems, it just seems so weird that it's happening here. Yeah. I, I remember last time. Um, I think last time we did a car share. Um, I picked you up from the house, and they all spoke Spanish as their first language. Yeah, that was odd. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was it was, it was fine, but it, it, it just uh, when you when you meet someone, when you when you when you live with people, it could be like friends and you're all going to become mates eventually when you're moving and everyone speaks Spanish and doesn't speak English that well and have quite a thick accent but it's, you know it, other English people struggle with my accent sometimes so it, it's just a, just a little <laughs> just a little odd yeah. I've just remembered though that one of them uh, he didn't live there but one of his uh, Spanish mates was came in once and um, what was he talking about he started talking about um, like flat earth stuff oh shit and you know, and you're like, whenever whenever anyone talks to you about flat earth stuff, you assume they're joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At first, until you talk to you a bit more seriously, <laughs> and then, um, but he said something about, and then you know, and it's just like I've just come in to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, and he's just started talking to me for some reason <laughs> about the flat earth. I can't remember what it was. He also said about um, we had the golden ratio. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the, the thing it's like a particular size rectangle. The ratio of this length, length to the side, the particular shape, of what looks most aesthetically perfect for like the Greek architecture or whatever. He said about that, and then said about how you see that everywhere. But was then just like pointing to stuff in our kitchen. <laughs> he said about the golden ratio, but it was just like anything that's a rectangle. Right. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he didn't specific, it was meant a specific ratio of the length of the thing, just any rectangle, as if that was significant. Normally, it's preschool you start cracking on with shapes, but. Fair play to him. Yeah, every every rectangle that you saw seemed to be some kind of Illuminati code for <laughs> something. 
Um, so, uh, motivation for your character, uh, your neighbour. Yeah. The narrator has just spoken to a milkman. He's on a roll of talking to strangers. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what else do you do but chat to your neighbour when, when Martians invade <laughs> your, your planet? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's weird, isn't it? He said. I mean, it's a shame that you, you can't, like, go near them, you know. It's be good to, like, learn what they're like and now they live on another planet and that, yeah. You know, yeah, thanks for that really insightful viewpoint, neighbour. Oh yeah, hot water's great, but if it's too hot it burns you. Yeah, what a shame, this boiling water is hot. Ugh, idiot. Don't even know why he's bothering to talk to him. He came up to the fence and extended a handful of strawberries, for his gardening was as generous as it was enthusiastic. Now I know why they're friends. He's all in it for the straw game. At the same time, he told me of the burning of the pine woods about the my fleet golf links. <gasps> Not, Not the, the Bifleet, Bifleet Golf Links! They say, said he, apparently there's another one coming, you know, but um, I mean, you think one would be enough, but I mean, it's going to cost insurance people a lot, but you know. He laughed with an air of the greatest good humour as he said this. <laughs> the woods, he said, were still burning, and pointed out a haze of smoke to me. They'll be hot underfoot for days, on account of the thick soil of pine needles and turf. I don't actually understand why soil is hot. Well, hey, I can answer this. Is it? Is that clear? <laughs> um, it's uh, well, I mean, oh, the woods, the woods were still burning. Yeah, you said that. Yeah. So yeah. it the the idea is, man, it's like um, you know, Saddleworth Moor has loads of fires, right? Yeah. And the the reason is because because of the material that they've got, um, on the moors, if you go deep down, there's loads of peat and bog, and so when they have a fire, the heat, like the the embers, just rather than just dying out they go further down into the ground so all the pine needles mean that there's like loads beneath the layer that it's going to be hot oh yeah just so you know mate <laughs> yeah <laughs> now i know uh ace thanks buddy he said and then grew serious over poor ogilvy word up for poor ogilvy boy after breakfast instead of working i decided to walk towards the common just take the day off, all right for you. Under the railway bridge, I found a group of soldiers. Sappers, I, I think. Men in small round caps, dirty red jackets unbuttoned, and showing their blue shirts, dark trousers and boots coming up to the car. Sappers are a type of army soldier that do engineering. They make bridges and things like that. They wear fancy red coats like they work at Butlins, where I go for my family holidays. Okay, see you later, bye. They told me no one was allowed over the canal, and, looking along the road towards the bridge, I saw one of the cardigan men standing sentinel there. Knitted wool with a button hem. Stylish and ready to unleash mayhem. Who's that there coming over the hill? They're two by two and they're dressed to kill. One part cardigan, one part man. A scowl on the face and a pocket by the hand. The life is pain and suffering. A hybrid of human flesh and knitting. It's against nature, it's against the law. They're the warmest army you ever saw. Big lads wrapped in clothes woolen. Clad and ready for Armageddon. Open fire! Argyle forward! Take cover! Cable this! Retreat! Suppressing fire! Elder Pan attack! We need a medic! The tailor is gone! A terrible armor from the bullet of a gun. I don't know if you get the premise yet. It's a horror of war in a light jacket. I talked with these soldiers for a time. I told them of my sight of the Martians on the previous evening. None of them had seen the Martians, and they had but the vaguest ideas of them so that they plied me with questions. They said that they did not know who had authorised the movements of the troops, 
Their idea was that a great dispute had arisen at the horse guards. The ordinary sapper is a great deal better educated than the common soldier, and they discussed the peculiar conditions of the possible fight with some acuteness. The ordinary sapper is a great deal better educated than the common soldier, and they discussed the peculiar conditions of the possible fight with some acuteness. I described the heat rate to them, and they began to argue amongst themselves. Once again, H.G. Wells is going to dip into that deep river of expertise he has in writing dialect. So I, I am joined by Lucas Kirkby and Tommy Laurie. You know, you know my real, you know my real name, though, don't you, Eddie? Yeah, of course, I, of course, I do, uh, Brad. Lee? Oh. Bradley Denver. Now, for all those keen eared listeners, it's me, Tom Lawrenson. So, you guys, you are part of Vision. What, could you tell, tell me a bit about it? Uh, some people have said it's like uh, League of Gentlemen meets Harry Potter. It's like a, a really unusual, creepy, <laughs> dark uh, Osama bin Laden retelling of the harry potter story which is what everybody needs <laughs> and so y you guys are experts at adapting and and shaking stuff up so i thought you'd be perfect to bring onto the show um which uh, of course is on war of the worlds uh, uh, do either of you know about war of the worlds no well i know it's a book and it it's hg wells isn't it now i read the i read the time machine about six months ago Oh, uh, which yeah. was what you which was him. Uh, yeah, it was good. It was like you know West Side Story, but with aliens. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it was good. It was good. So um, I think I've actually got this as a book, but I've just not read it. That's fair. Well, hey, that's why the podcast's here. I first heard of War of the Worlds when I was a about an eight year old boy. Um, my friend in my friend had a CD of it. You know the uh, audio, the radio play. Oh the, yeah, yeah. The original radio. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. You know, the mu maybe it wasn't the original, but you know the one with all the music. Yes, the Jeff Jeff Wayne musical. And we, I remember, we we sat and listened to it in the dark, and the music alone terrified us. You know, the chances of anything coming to earth. We would when we had we'd we'd be thrilled and have to turn it off. It was like. Yeah, it was, we were spooked. <laughs> no, so we just listened to that. <laughs> I don't think we made it past the first 10 minutes. I just uh, And then, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever actually... Um, I think I've seen bits of the Tom Cruise film. Yeah, that, that film is a headache. I rewatched it. Is it. Yeah, it's just so much. <laughs> so I thought um, I wanted to get you guys on to be soldiers for this scene. So the narrator sees some soldiers who have arrived um, and it's basically just to chat about that. Um, have you guys ever been soldiers before? I once was a, I once was an extra as a soldier in a film, like a, a medieval soldier. Okay. But I was never actually in it. But I went for two days. They pay me uh, 50 quid a day. And I just sat in this marquee and at buffet. And uh, I never got used. And so, uh, but I could only do the two days. And then I ended up being like credited in this film with my name spelt wrong, and I wasn't even in it. <laughs> oh, mate. Well, I mean, here it's going to be the polar mm. opposite, because there's no there's no buffet, but you are 100%. And no pay. Yeah, there's no pay. Yeah. But I'm going to be in it. Cl clarify that. There's absolutely no pay. And in about 20 years, I'll merge the two memories together per to yeah. create, like, a memory of something I got paid and was actually in. Have you ever have you ever been in the army, Tom? Petty, I think you know me well enough to know that I've never yeah. been in the army. I'm, I'm a 19 year old boy. What time would I have had to be in the army? <laughs> um, I was a I was a bit of a cowboy as a younger lad. A bit of a cowboy. Yeehaw! I was a cowboy enthusiast. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I went more for cowboy. I was cowboy. Uh, I don't know if it started from like Toy Story, like in Woody, but there's photos of me with like you know. In a pair of jeans with the full kit. No, I mean, wait, hang on. I had to, I had to preface full pair of jeans because I was about to use the term assless chaps. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say assless chaps, people are going to pitch your, your bum out. <laughs> sure. But uh, yeah. Give the people what they want. But I was like full cowboy gear, you know, that little uh, assless chaps, waistcoat, boots, gun, uh, and a load of f bullets. In a hat, yeah, big cowboy boy. I thought I was gonna be a cowboy when I was older. What what happened? I had a go at it for a bit, you know, <laughs> cleaning cow anuses, but it wasn't for me in the end. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, it's very different in it when you just go up to Yorkshire. And yeah, you got to use Stetson your fingers. Doesn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas, why are you grimacing? The idea of you putting your finger up a cow's anus. <laughs> I think that's yeah. a fair grimace. Uh, fair, 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 fair grimace. It's too late for me to change the podcast name, but that should be it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair grim, or it's the story of the uh, McDonald's mascot. You know the the one, the big purple lad called Grimace. Yeah, yeah. Fair Him Grimace. Friend. That'd be a good uh, Netflix to... film, couldn't it? Crawl up under cover and rush him, say I. Said one. Get out. Said another. What's cover against this eerie? Sticks to cook ya. What we gotta do is go as near as the ground or levels and drive a trench. Blow your trenches. You always want trenches. You ought to have been born a rabbit, Snippy. Finally, another name, and it is Snippy. Snippy. Are you lads proposing that they haven't got any necks? They can't whip round and have a look. You can't, you can't just assume. You can't turn around and have a peek at you. There's no, you can't sneak up on Alum. Said a third abruptly. A little contemplative dark man smoking a pipe. I repeated my description. Octopuses! Oh, you, lads, lads, I know I say octopuses a lot, but right now I mean it. Because if you think about it, uh, you're saying we can't sneak up on them, yeah? And trenches won't work, yeah? Those are the two things you can't use against octopuses. Talk about fishes of men! Fight is a vicious is this time. It ain't no murder killing beasts like that, said the first speaker. Why not shell the damn things straight off and finish them, said the little dark man. You can't tell what they might do. Where's your shells, said the first speaker. There ain't no time. Do it in a rush, that's my tip, and do it at once. So they discussed it and went on to the railway station to get as many morning papers as I could. But I will not weary the reader with a description of the long morning and of the longer afternoon. Uh, this is Wells's way of saying, like, I think it's a bit boring now, I can't be bothered. I did not succeed in getting a glimpse of the common, for every horsel and Chobham church towers were in the hands of military authorities. The soldiers I addressed didn't know anything. The officers were mysterious as well as busy. Ooh, dreamy officers! I found people in the town quite secure again in the presence of the military, and I heard for the first time from Marshall, the tobacconist. Oh, bloody hell, he's throwing out names now. Mar- Snippy Marshall? That his son was among the dead on the common. Uh, now I feel bad. The soldiers had made the people on the outskirts of Horsell lock up and leave their houses. I got back to lunch about two. Very tired for, as I have said, the day was extremely hot and dull. And in order to refresh myself, I took a cold bath in the afternoon. Oh, hey, narrator, how are those uh, bike lessons going, mate? Uh, no, you're going to take a cold bath. Fine, 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 fine. Not going to write a little bit of a philosophical paper. Oh, no, 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 no. Stay, stay in the bath. Just just have a short one there. You've, you've earned it, I guess. About half past four, I went to the railway station to get an evening paper. He's been in the bath for two and a half hours. Who is this guy? For the morning papers had contained only a very inaccurate description of the killing of Stent, Henderson, Ogilvy and the others. But there was little I didn't know. The Martians did not show an inch of themselves. They seemed busy in their pit, and there was a sound of hammering and an almost continuous steamer of smoke. Apparently, they were busy getting ready for a struggle. Fresh attempts have been made to signal, but without success, was a stereotyped formula of the papers. A sapper told me it was done by a man in the ditch with a flag on a long pole. The Martians took as much notice of such advances as we should the lowing of a cow. Ooh, the Martians may have a heat ray, but they don't need it to give humans a sick burn. I must confess, the sight of all this armament, all this preparation, greatly excited me. My imagination became belligerent, and defeated the invaders in a dozen striking ways. Something of my schoolboy dreams of battle and heroism came back. It hardly seemed a fair fight to me at the time. They seemed very helpless in that pit of theirs. At three o'clock there began the thud of a gun at measured intervals from Chertsey or Adelstone. I learned that the smouldering pine wood into which the second cylinder had fallen was being shelled in the hope of destroying that object before it opened. It was only about five, however, that a field gun reached Chobham for use against the first body of Martians. 
about six in the evening, as I sat at tea with my wife in the summer house talking vigorously about the battle that was lowering upon us, I heard a muffled detonation from the common, and immediately after a gust of firing. Close on the heels of that came a violent, rattling crash, quite close to us, that shook the ground, and starting out upon the lawn I saw the tops of the trees about the Oriental College burst into smoky red flame, and the tower of the little church beside it slide down into ruin. The pinnacle of the mosque had vanished, and the roof line of the college itself looked as if a hundred ton gun had been at work upon it. One of our chimneys crashed as if a shot had hit it, flew, and a piece of it came clattering down the tiles and made a heap of broken red fragments upon the flower bed by my study window. Ogilvy, Henderson, Stent, my chimney, RIP, Fallen Brothers. I and my wife stood amazed. Then I realised that the crest of Maybury Hill must be within range of the Martian's heat ray, now that the college was cleared out of the way. At that, I gripped my wife's arm, and without ceremony ran her out into the road. Then I fetched out the servant, telling her I'd go upstairs myself for the box she was clamouring for. So I wanted to ask you some, I was going to ask you some alien-based questions. Right, yeah. You, if somebody said, like, like somebody reputable, like a reputable source like the news or something said that aliens... <laughs> well... <laughs> Do you want to start that again? New, if numerous news reports, you know, it's not like it's not like just one of them. Um, okay. Okay. Like, yeah. Eight, Martians are here. They're shooting off. They're livid. Yeah. And it's like it's happening right by you. What would what would you do? Would you would you stay around or would you leave? Um, I think you're gonna have to be more specific before I give you an answer. Um, okay. For example, like. As any other creature on this planet, um, or off it. So, if something was coming towards me and, or like coming onto my street, hey, <laughs> I would probably get an umbrella. <laughs> um, if, um, okay. if something was coming to say hello, and it was like sort of going, hey, yeah, you're right, yeah. like sniff, 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 sniff. <laughs> like, I'd be like, oh, well, I'll give it a chance. You know, that, that's that sounds just like like that. That's a dog that's come onto your street to say. Hello. Yeah, well, it could be a dog, or it could be like it could have tentacles, and it could have like some different number of arms, and it could have okay. um, you know, a willy where its head is or something. Like that's true. But it's I think it's like all about energy and like connection, and I think if yeah. you look at a living being and i just think you can like feel its aura sort of thing so like if it's really you know if it looks at you and it's like hello uh, this is nice like where am i i had to run away from my alien home where i was safe and all i want is a cuddle and a little saucer of j2o then um <laughs> then i think you know in that way i'd probably stick around because then i could have like a sanctuary like i always wanted then yeah um that sounds nice yeah but okay so turns out that they're really not like that then they're, they're nasty buggers oh yeah i'd uh i'd i'd leave relatively quickly okay. yeah i mean like look at me i you know I, as fierce as i am uh sure um obviously i could take them but i choose not to yeah, because yeah. that's true. That's true power, isn't it? Yeah, so. absolutely. And I don't want to take a being's life, even if it does seem evil. Who am I to judge? Yeah, and so I just think like that's a responsibility that I, I don't really want to have. Also, I quite like the idea of music calming them down. Like I think if you played an angry person heavy metal music, yeah, then it could go one or two ways. And I'd like to experiment with that. I think. Okay. Yeah. What music would you play to a to a Martian? Um, probably like Hinder or Hailstorm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Papa Roach. No, not Papa Roach. Yeah. Yeah, and then see if they respond because I think then they'd be like, "Oh yeah, I'm getting into this," but they'd also be like, "I I feel a connection to this song," and then they might feel like they had a connection to humanity. Um, and then you could try some Bake Off, like the Bake Off soundtrack. 
you know, because that's quite oh, nice. nice. And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. That Something exists like... for its soundtrack, doesn't it? Like, yeah. Little, 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 little. Some, some of that. That's just Irish music, yeah. then, isn't it? What I just did then. That's just. <laughs> is that, is that <laughs> Irish music? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for for sharing that cultural experience with me, Betsy. That was great. So you get told you've got to. You're. They're like Betsy. We've chosen you to say hello to the Martians. You need to. What you're gonna? You like. You're gonna go say hello to them. They're in a hole, just hanging out, and we need you to greet them. What would you? What would you do? How would you say hi? Um, I'm quite a traditional person, so I think probably like a, uh, like a, a Morris dance with a maypole nice. would be my go-to, I think. With, with your Irish music? With the Irish music, yeah. Yeah, I think so, because you can't, I don't think you can be offended really by, um, by men with bells on their socks and women with batons um yeah. skipping because in many ways that's 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 like a like it's a warm welcome that can't possibly be construed as um as aggressive but it's also yeah. not like here's the cake because you don't want to like yeah. just roll over and 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 get it yeah i know i get you because it's sort of like you're bringing your culture to them but it's just like, well, if you don't want it, we're having a great time anyway. So that's it. Up yours. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said for for capitalising on on our heritage as a planet, and um, yeah. and dancing has been a part of our planet. And ultimately, if these tentacle alien people want to have a jig about, then then they need to know that they are welcome to do so. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah, you've nailed it. I think they're going to really enjoy that. I think they are going to enjoy Earth. Yeah. I don't think I th- there's I any think... need to panic yet. In fact, I think if if instead of just like walking up to them with a white flag, there'd been Morris dancers there. Yeah, they should have jigged up with them. Like at the very least. Would have been a you know, with, very different with story. With the flag could have been like a, a, a sword, a sword yeah. dance, you know, with, yeah. with a flag at the end. You know, essentially bunting. That could have worked better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If they'd only put the white cloth in a so triangle. So a few more on. Is it surrender? Yeah. Is it a welcome? Is it a please don't eat us? But here's a, a massive dog-sized fly for you to snack on. Um, <laughs> you know, it's ambiguous without being evasive. I think that yeah, that's the key, really. That's great. In my <laughs> professional opinion. We can't possibly stay here. I said. And as I spoke, the firing reopened for a moment upon the common. What? Where are we gonna go? I don't know. I don't know. We can't can't knock around here though. There's like a war on. Well, Dorothy did. We not got a basement. No, we don't have that. We've still not we've still not converted it to meth. Said my wife in terror. I thought perplexed. We could go to my cousin. Then I remembered her cousins at Leatherhead. Leatherhead! I shouted above the sudden noise. She looked away from me downhill. The people were coming out of their houses, astonished. I mean, to be fair, you would be, wouldn't you? She said. Down the hill, I saw a bevy of hussars ride under the railway bridge. That's a great phrase, isn't it? Bevy of hussars, love that. Oh, just gone out for a bevy of hussars. Three galloped towards the open gates of the Oriental College. Two others dismounted and began running from house to house. So uh, at this point, I, I had a look, and Oriental College was a real place. It was like a like a like an actual college. It was sort of a museum that uh, it, it ran for about twenty years, and then it got turned into a into a practicing mosque, um, which is kind of interesting. So it's sort of like uh, this is the equivalent of like the, the the Big Ben getting crushed or something like that. This is what he landed on was a a college used to collect objects that the empire had stolen from other places. The sun, shining through the smoke that drove up from the tops of the trees, seemed blood red and threw an unfamiliar lurid light upon everything. (coughs) 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 Metaphor alert! Blood red sun! Foreshadowing! Lurid light! Cold light of day! Danger afoot! Tops of the trees as 
previously it's the top of the tree so it's 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 the tr trees are being used as a as a means of the first sight of something bad happening stop here said i you're safe here and i started off at once for the spotted dog that is just an excuse to go to the pub you good for nothing drunkard look i might have a pint when i go there but come on there is i've got a lot going on do you want me to bring you something who back? else is there no one. Who else are you going to see? Yeah, there Frank, is. Fra Frank will be there. I've checked your WhatsApp. Yeah, okay. There's Frank and Lawrence, but nobody else is there. And they're just there. Any they're just there to like stay. Oh, they're just there. That's yeah. what you said last time. They're just there. They're just there. They're not gonna. I'm not gonna talk. I won't even look at them. Like. Well, no. You look at them. You look them right in the eye. You talk to them, and I want to know everything that's gone on, right? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, what if I, I'll, I'll take, I'll record them and come back. Yeah, because then... it's all about trust. I want to hear yeah. what you say is what you say. And I want to know that you're not lying. And I want to know that you are able to confide in me the stuff that you don't want to confide in me for. Okay, I can do, I'll do that. I'll do that to, to you. I'll go get the cart though, because we do need that to get away. Okay. If they've got skips, can you get skips? For I knew the landlord had a horse and dog cart. Hello, it's me. Uh, just to explain that a, a dog cart, it's not a cart for dogs. Like, it's not a dog pulling a cart. It's, it's, it's what you'd put a horse on and it's a smaller cart that would be pulled along. It's like a size, it's a description because a man and a dog can fit onto it. I ran for, I perceived that in a moment, everyone upon this side of the hill would be moving. I found him in his bar quite unaware of what was going on behind his house. A man stood with his back to me, talking to him. I must have a pound, said the landlord, and I've no one to drive it. I'll give you two, said I, over the stranger's shoulder. Whoa. And I'll bring it back by midnight, I said. No, said the landlord. What's the hurry? I'm selling my bit of a pig. Two pounds and you bring it back? What's going on now? Oh, he's selling a bit of pig. Uh, must have a pound. It's a little, uh, little joke. Where's your dog? Where's your old dog? I explained hastily that I had to leave my home, and so secured the dog cart. At the time, it did not seem to me nearly so urgent that the landlord should leave his. Fuck you, landlord, I've got your cart. Oi! I took care to have the cart there and then, drove it off down the road, and, leaving it in charge of my wife and servant, rushed into my house and packed a few valuables, such plate as we had, and so forth. Martians have attacked, what are you gonna tell you? Get the dinnerware, wherever we're going, we're going to need dinner. The beech trees below the house were burning while I did this, and the palings up the road glowed red. <laughs> Metaphor alert, glowing red palings. Terror getting closer, incoming danger. Metaphor alert. <laughs> while I was occupied in this way, one of the dismantled hussars came running up. He was going from house to house, warning people to leave. He was going on as I came out of the front door, lugging my treasures done up in a tablecloth. I shouted after him. What news? That's his catchphrase. He turned, stared, bawled something about, crawling out in a thing like a dish cover, and ran on to the gate of the house at the crest. A sudden whirl of black smoke driving across a road hid him for a moment. I ran to my neighbour's door and rapped to satisfy myself of what I already knew, that his wife had gone to London with him and had locked up their house. I went in again, according to my promise, to get my servant's box, lugged it out, clapped it beside her on the tail of a dog cart, and then caught the reins and jumped into the driver's seat beside my wife. I suppose she can have all her worldly possessions, but only after she has watched me bring out every single piece of Tupperware in my house. In another moment, we were clear of the smoke and noise, and spanking down the opposite slope of Maybury Hill towards Old Woking. <laughs> that clearly, that clearly doesn't mean spanking. It clearly doesn't mean what, what I think you <laughs> In front was a quiet, sunny landscape a wheat field ahead on either side of the road, and the Maybury Inn with its swinging sign. I saw the doctor's car ahead of me. I'm assuming this is like a new character named the Doctor, as, as is his want, rather than Doctor Who. 
At the bottom of the hill, I turned my head to look at the hillside I was leaving. Thick streamers of black smoke shot with threads of red fire were driving upward into the still air and throwing dark shadows upon green treetops eastward. The smoke already extended far away to the east and west, to Byfleet Pine Woods eastward. Not Byfleet Pine Woods! And to Woking on the west, the road was dotted with people running towards us, and very faint now, but very distinct through the hot, quiet air, one heard the whir of a machine gun that was presently stilled, and an intermittent cracking of rifles. Apparently the Martians were setting fire to everything within range of their heat ray. I am not an expert driver. Yeah, no shit with your bike skills. And I had immediately to turn my attention to the horse. When I looked back again, the second hill had hidden the black smoke. I slashed the horse with the whip and gave him a loose rein until Woking and Send lay between us and that quivering tumult. I overtook and passed the doctor between Woking and Send. So long now, you healing loser! Hey! Ooh, we're on our way to send, baby! Take that, Doctor. So, what an episode we've had. It has been a whole episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. I had a blast making this one. It was great actually speaking to other people. Because, look, it's nice doing this on my own, and I quite like the, uh, the, the, the solo creative opportunity that it provides me but it's also nice to talk to other humans every once and again a thank you so much for everyone who was on uh let's let's do the run through of them now so we had tom lawrenson and lucas kirkby of potter vision you can follow them at the potter vision uh they're also at tom lawrenson and at lucas kirkby uh they're, they're amazing improvisers and potter vision is brilliant like even if you're not a fan of harry potter if you're a fan of harry potter amazing if you're not a fan of Harry Potter, still amazing. Um, they've got some shows coming up later this year, uh, fingers crossed. Uh, there's one in London um, on the 28th of October, and there's another in Manchester on the 29th of October. So if you enjoyed them and you want to see more of them, go go get the tickets. Um, this uh, Tom Little is on at This Is Tom Little. He has some absolutely amazing videos on Twitter, some really funny stuff. Uh, he's a great joke writer in the, the videos that he's doing. They like these theme tunes to um, Coronation Street and many more tv shows classic british tv shows which is brilliant um, and last but of course not least the wife uh, bexy archer at bexy archer uh, she's on twitter instagram everywhere her comedy group your dad's mum uh, with kevin dewsbury is very good uh, they'll be doing shows i'm sure as soon as it's legally and socially responsible to do so uh, so be sure to check them out also i'd like to say a big thank you to you for listening along thanks it means so much to me that this daft little project that i've been slogging me guts out on is uh, actually been received warmly so what a treat for me uh, please do follow me on twitter on facebook or instagram at eddie hurst or if you want to get in touch with me uh, via email you've got any questions or you want to send some stuff um somebody the other day sent me a sent me a message about the uh, fires on chobham so that was quite uh, quite funny i don't know if, if you guys saw it on the page but uh, chobham common sat on fire uh, which is very very close to horse or common um as we know from the book um and and there was a there was a potentially a heat ray maybe uh, the only heat ray here is years of global warming anyway it was quite funny stuff i'd share also that brian may uh, his his house was affected in it which isn't funny that his house is affected in it but it's funny that brian may you know a, a, a 70s 80s uh, sort of glam musician who very much is in the wheelhouse of jeff wayne uh, was also involved in the story Anyway, guys, so please uh, follow all of those guys. Follow me. Uh, keep listening to the show. Rate it, subscribe it, share it out. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next week for Chapter 10, Into the Storm. Eddie Hurst podcast version of The War of the Worlds is produced and written by Eddie Hurst and H.G. Wells. Special thanks this episode to Lucas Kirkby, Tom Lawrenson, Tom Little, Bexy Archer, and also a big special thank you to Matt Hoss for extra editing help. Um, he runs a fantastic podcast called Castable amongst his Twitching schedule as well. That's uh, Twitch, the online streaming platform, rather than Twitching as in bird watching. So please uh, follow everybody. Thank you very much. Rate, subscribe, share, like, tell neighbours, tell anyone, write a little uh, message on a coaster, put it under a mat in a, in a cafe if you wish to. Thank you very much, guys. See you next week. Bye! Hello, Eddie Hurst's podcast version of the War of the Worlds listeners. I'm Barry McStay. I'm Ben Vanderveld. And we'd love you to listen to Worst Foot Forward, our podcast all about failure. Each week we are joined by a guest to discuss the world's worst something. From detective to invasion, train to horror movie. 
we dive into humankind's darkest depths in search of the absolute pits. And as HG Wells fans, you'd be glad to know we've covered worst aliens, worst robot, and worst space invention. Spoiler alert, it's almost definitely the spacesuit invented for humans to have sex in. On Worst Foot Forward, we've learned that conspiracy theorists think rocks aren't really hard, why one French physicist invaded the Channel Island of Sark, and how exactly to make a wasp gun. While also uncovering the railway station of the dead, the doctor who put goat balls into human scrotums, and the West End musical funded by bird poo. Subscribe to Worst Foot Forward on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Check out our website, worstfootforwardpodcast.com, and join us for some fun-filled zero worship.